Robin Hood Radio and the Robin Hood Radio Network is proud to present Leonard Lopate at Large, lively hour-long in-depth discussions providing overviews and context to topics usually covered in partial measures. His guests include leading thinkers, scientists, artists, economists, farmers, historians, authors, and politicians. Mr. Lopate is a Peabody Award winner whose numerous honors include three Associated Press Awards and three James Beard Awards. Welcome to Leonard Lopate at Large. I'm Leonard Lopate. During the 2016 presidential campaign, Donald Trump promised to dramatically scale back the Environmental Protection Agency and eliminate many of what he called the intrusive regulations that were enacted with the goal of protecting our health and the environment. We're now a year and a half into his administration, and although Scott Pruitt, the man he chose to head the EPA, has resigned, the changes continue. We've asked industrial hygienist Monona Russell to look into what the Trump administration has done in this area so far and the impact it's had on the EPA, OSHA, and other agencies. Ms. Russell is founder and president of Arts, Crafts, and Theater Safety Incorporated, the author of Pick Your Poison, How Our Mad Dash to Chemical Utopia is Making Lab Rats of Us All. It's published by Wiley. Monona, welcome to our show. Well, thank you. Uh, you have described yourself as a troublemaker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is that your job, troublemaker? Yes, that's it. I, I'm a professional troublemaker. Uh, I, I run the nonprofit that you mentioned, but I'm also the safety consultant for SAG-AFTRA and the safety officer for USA 829 International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees. So I have a, a lot of responsibilities for safety on the set, safety in theaters, and so on. So you make a lot of enemies. What I always explain is that really important people hate me, and it's a lovely feeling. Is what you do being affected as well by uh, current policies, or uh, is it separate from the, the things that we're we were going to talk about fortunately, and we'll talk about the EPA, OSHA, et cetera. Fortunately, it's quite separate because we have been working on safety in the unions for a long time, and we have developed a number of policies, and we're not changing those policies. Uh, and those are very often negotiated policies. So we're, at, uh, we're kind of isolated from that. But we're getting the pushback from the people who think that all of these regulations, not only EPA but OSHA, is all just a waste of time and just a, a, a hindrance for business. And that's what we're seeing again. Well, how would they affect, <clears throat> let's say, somebody who's a member of SAG, Screen Actors Guild? Well, I'm a member of AFTRA. But all I do is sit in a radio station, uh, you know, sit at a mic. I, I can't imagine that there's anything too dangerous we're, we're, here. The, the most common location for shooting a movie in New York City <laughs> is an abandoned building. Now, when property is abandoned in New York, there's usually a reason. <laughs> so these are very often dangerous places and full of asbestos and lead and structural hazards and rats. And Do you know that one of the producers makes a difference between... Aggressive and passive rats. I mean, to me, a rat's pretty much a rat. Um, but we, we have some dangerous conditions, and then we do dangerous things with special effects and pyrotechnics. And uh, in, in, in film, they were using here in the area um, bullet hits that look like bullets, you know, that come out of the wall or off a person's chest. And those were made with lead stephanate so that people were breathing a lot of lead fume. Uh, on the West Coast, they're still doing that. So, I mean, there's a lot of hazards to film that you wouldn't think of that come under OSHA regulations, and some of them come under EPA as well. And so we have, we've worked out policy for a lot of these, and we're just sticking to our guns. Do you see an overall governing concept behind President Trump's environmental policies? Is the goal just to get rid of as many regulations as he can? Absolutely, and it's just so typical of anybody who is a, a, a developer and uh, on the construction side and on the um, um, real estate side of things. It's, it's what you always see. Uh, he actually thinks asbestos is just a... a, 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 a you know, a, a myth. Well, he thinks the best of asbestos. 
Yeah, because he he doesn't want to have to abate it and protect the workers. And he thinks that the EPA regulations on the waste that they have to get rid of and how they have to do that, that just slows him down. Um, and, and, you know, working out all of these things, he just wants it to all go away. And he's working hard to make it go away. And he has some pretty good advice. He, you know, people saying he doesn't know what he's doing. Oh, yeah, he does in this area. And he's picked people who are going to really take out these regulations. Before he was named head of the EPA, Scott Pruitt said that he wanted to eliminate the EPA altogether. How much was he able to change before he Oh, went? huge, huge change. Um, Are and, they permanent changes or... Well, they've been, they have been permanent changes change again and back. again. They were permanent changes in the Reagan administration. They were permanent changes in the first Bush administration and in the second Bush administration. And, and then you have to get a Democrat who will go in there and will say, you know, we're really screwing up here, and then try to fix it. And then pretty soon people will get tired of it, and we'll have another permanent set of changes. So we slide back. We, and we're definitely sliding back seriously now. And, and, and some of these changes are permanent in the sense that the damage that they do can't be corrected. Be, people get hurt. Such as? The environment is damaged. Well, carbon dioxide levels in the air, for gosh sakes. You know, every time we don't follow those rules, we're hurting the earth and... and, and and, and you have to realize that this is exactly the plan because Bush has the strategy of complaining about how everyone is taking advantage of the United States. He's the one taking advantage because he's competing with them without doing the environmental stuff. Of course he can do it cheaper if he doesn't follow the environmental stuff. And so he, he's the one who's really busy going back to almost laissez-faire capitalism and even tariffs in order to, to, to compete, and he's doing very well. You meant Trump, not Bush. I mean but, Trump. <laughs> so, what do you know about Pruitt's successor, Andrew Wheeler? Is he going to follow Pruitt's lead? Oh, there's going to be just no change at all, just going to just smooth transition. He was in the, uh, fir- he was in the uh, uh, first Bush administration, uh, 89 to 93, busy trying to mess up EPA back then. Um, he, he, he was on uh, the, one of the Senate committees um, for the environment, and he was busy doing the same thing then. Um, and uh, now he's, uh, he, he's just coming off of a job where he was busy uh, even trying to get rid of the, um, the Bear Ears monument for a, U- a uranium company that he was uh, associated with. So he has never, there's never been any break in his uh, activity on, on EPA. Some of the names that pop up are recognizable for other reasons. For example, Ronald Reagan's head of the EPA was Ann Gorsuch, the mother of the new Supreme Court justice. And uh, she was cited for contempt of Congress because she was trying to do pretty much the same thing that Scott Pruitt has done more recently. Absolutely. Reagan was the first one. And, 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 in and my Richard f- Nixon is the one who gave us the EPA. Yeah, I don't under, quite understand that either. And in, in, in 71, when we got the, the OSHA regulations and, and the, some of the EPA stuff, we had the best regulations for both workers and the environment in the world. And it's just been all downhill since then. Now, haven't a lot of longtime EPA employees resigned, mostly scientists? Yes, um, and, and people that are going to retire. What, 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 what I think of when I look at the, at the people who left is he's changing the culture and the personnel that go along with that culture. So that the people that are left are the people that are either easily manipulated or who don't have EPA's best um, intentions at, 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 at heart either. But, and scientists are feeling frustrated because weren't most of the EPA regulations put into place because scientific studies showed that particular substances and practices were harmful to the environment? Yes. There's a group called the um, um, Public Employees for Environmental Responsibility. If you want to know about who's quitting, get on their website because they are they are really honest 
good people. <laughs> I, I have a lot of experience with them in other areas of uh, EPA uh, complaints and, and issues, and they really uh, keep track of this. And they, they, they say that an awful lot of these people are just leaving in disgust. I mean, why would you work your whole life and then just see your work just turned around in, in, a, in a day? What's become of the data from the, the studies that were used? Well, that's another really interesting. If you're if you do research like I do in these areas, anything in the area of environment or occupational health, and you have pulled something off of a website that you like or a study that's there, get it, make a hard copy or make sure you download it because some of this stuff is starting to disappear. If there's a, an, an opinion that doesn't go along with their views on that website, it's going to go away. They're they just erasing them? Yeah, they're just taking them down. They're just uh, eliminating. And I, What about the work that's been published in reputable scientific journals? Yeah, and even that. You have to hunt for them. Instead, instead of seeing them on the website, sometimes you have to go hunt for them through the journal. Um, so it's, it's becoming more difficult. Um, it, it, it's just, a, again, this, this steady disinformation. And if they were replacing it with an argument, like another study that said a different thing, but they're not doing that. They're just replacing it with their own words, saying this is how it is, which I, I've just, you know, I, We've seen it before, but not quite as stark as I'm seeing it now. Scott Pruitt had what he called a secret science rule. Would it have required the EPA to only use data for rulemaking that's already available to the public? See, that's an interesting issue. Because there are trade secrets. There are trade secret stuff, and there are, there are studies that are also proprietary and secret, and some of them on toxicity. Um you see, because of the way our laws, our laws are set up that chemicals are innocent until proven guilty. And um, so it doesn't make business sense to ever test a chemical for toxicity because you're crying wolf. Um, so most co companies don't study. They wait for somebody to get sick and then the government will study. Your taxes will do it. And that was true during All every administration, That's Obama been from administration, the Clinton administration, as well as Republican we, administration. We have the wrong set up for our whole legal system in, involving chemicals. But now and again, a, a company would do an actual study and they would keep it to themselves. And EPA, they would sometimes share it with. But now, the way he wants to do this secret science regulation is saying, unless it's out there in a public journal, we can't use it. So even chemicals the industry knows are toxic will not be regulated because that data will not be acceptable as a rationale. That's just nuts. Are they also cutting back on rules that require studies of, of new substances and affect burying the existing studies and data and then preventing the collection of any new data? Well, yeah, they've always been doing that. That's That's been standard operating procedure, and, and it's just being increased. One one of the the sad parts of that is is that the activists have helped <laughs> with this because they have supported things like the Safe Chemicals Act. When the, when the Safe Chemicals Act first came out, it wasn't good enough for me even then, but at least it had a revolving list of at least 200 chemicals that were s scheduled to be studied in detail. That got cut down to 10, and now they're hoping to have five or so done in the next five years. It doesn't even, it's just ridiculous. It, it, that number is, is obscene. There are 32 million chemicals available for catalog purchase right now. The National Toxicology Program on their website, I hope it's still there, says that about 2,000 new chemicals go into our food and our products every year without essentially being studied. Um, what's this study of 10 chemicals? We don't care hardly. I mean, you know, and, and they're the they're the well-known suspects, you know, things like formaldehyde. We already know. Get over it. Move on. But uh, We knew a whole bunch when Rachel Carson was writing her books. That was 
in the 60s. Yeah. Well, we just, we, we learned and then we forget. Oh, I don't know what is it DDT is. okay these days? <laughs> Somebody should. Um, but it's, it, it's just, we're not studying the chemicals. They're burying what, what there is there. Uh, it's, it's totally a disinformation campaign to just allow industry to do exactly what they want. Monona Russell is my guest on Leonard Lopate at Large today. She is a, an industrial hygienist, president of Arts, Crafts, and Theater Safety Incorporated, and a safety officer in local USA 829, and that's IATSE? Yeah. And this is WBAI 93, 99.5 FM in New York. Let's look at some of the specific rollbacks that have been instituted. Uh, you mentioned uh, a national monument, Utah's uh, Bears Ears, and uh, there's also the Grand Staircase Escalante. And aren't some 22 other monuments under review? Yeah. They're, and all they're, in Western states. All in Western states, and they're all over the place. Um, so this will allow people to do mining, um, uh, oil drilling, Ranching. Ranching, all of those things. Uh, and that's, again, just the purpose. Cut the, cut the size of those footprints and let people on those areas to, to, to do business. Um, it's, it's all one way. And we just heard that uh, the administration is looking at rollbacks in the Endangered Species Act. Why? Yeah, so now you can do Hasn't the drilling. Hasn't that been a great success? Yeah, and you're not going to have to worry about, you know, the, the uh, let's say, the black-footed ferret if you're going to be drilling there. I mean, it's just really, it's scary. Uh, every, all of those things that we've been working at to try to make sure we keep our, our animals and we keep the monuments and, and uh, is, is going. But haven't these acts to protect national monuments and wildlife actually had economic benefits that have been documented? Well, that you could have found so that. So is it a trade-off here? You could have found that evidence and, the, and some numbers to support it on the website before, but they took it down. It's no longer there. <laughs> So I mean, it's so strange. We, 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 you literally have to download what you like and quickly because anything that supports the idea of, 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 of protecting the environment is slowly sliding off of the website. But Republicans have to breathe the air too, don't they? I don't think so. <laughs> I'm beginning to wonder. Maybe they don't. <laughs> Have we seen solid support of this from Republicans? I imagine there are some Absolutely Democrats as well solid from, from some states I, yeah. where, which would be affected. I don't see. I, 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 well, when Enhofer defends the climate change with a snowball in, in the Senate, I mean, that's the level at which they're arguing. I um, mean, as long as they, they've got their air-conditioned cars, I guess <laughs> everything's fine by them. Hasn't the Trump administration also relaxed regulations on carbon and methane emissions for oil and gas companies? Yes. Uh, so yes. they get, they, they're they're kind of rewrite all of the Obama era rules. That's right. They, they literally they literally are working on that. What they haven't already done, <clears throat> they're working on, because you see, when you're doing fracking, for example, there were all kinds of tests that you had to do to make sure that the methane was not escaping. And there was, I was very interested in some of the recent. Uh, studies because it looked like they were severely underestimating the amount of methane that was coming off of some of these fracking uh, operations. But now you could just frack and you don't really have to worry about those and, kinds of things. And what kind of, da what kind of damage does methane do to the environment? It's another greenhouse gas. So we're, we're it's throwing... It's like carbon dioxide? Yeah, or? you're throwing all of this stuff into the, into the environment. And... Um, w w w w when we compete for our oil prices, we can we can make oil a lot cheaper than than companies in in countries that are actually following the rules. But fracking also seems to have had another effect. Uh, in Scott Pruitt's state, uh, there were earthquakes, weren't there? Apparently and yet nobody seemed they to just patch up all the cracks in the buildings and move on. Because yes, I mean Oklahoma in particular has had just a, a maze of 
of, of earthquakes. And some of them, you know, are, you know, just shaking some of those old buildings apart. And we don't know in the long run, maybe we're working up to a big one. You know, no one really understands why all of this is happening and just what it's going to mean. But stuff is shifting around down under there. That's because we're we're kind of drawing what uh, keeps things in place out of yeah. The, we got soda straws the... down there <laughs> sipping up the the the, 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 the milkshake, and we're going to end up with a big hollow under there somehow. And, and maybe <laughs> I, we should at least be trying to find out what's happening. But you don't see that concern anymore. You, you don't even see it in the, in the papers. What about the, the clean power plants? Is that something else that the EPA is getting rid of? Yes. <clears throat> Obama had a really good plan to uh, restrict the amount of mercury and carbon and other things that were coming off when they burned uh, coal <clears throat> and other things for power. And that was making a huge improvement. And some plants were going to have to switch to other forms of, 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 of fuel and so on. But now they can just go back and, and do what they were because all of that is, is slated to go away. If it hasn't gone away, it's slated to. Now, the, it seems to me that the uh, Obama administration didn't have totally clean hands either. I saw a, a documentary about a town in Arkansas that uh, Georgia Pacific uh, it's it's kind of company town for Georgia Pacific, and the pollution there is terrible. People are dying of cancer, and yet when they called the EPA during the Obama years, and nobody ever came, and nobody ever fined them. And this is a Georgia Pacific is owned by the Koch brothers. I don't know whether that is a reason. No, the Obama administration doesn't have clean hands. There's a lot of things that w were happening there. The, he was not perfect in this area. But when you compare them what, with what's going on now, he, he did a pretty decent job. But there were big gaps in, in, in what was happening there. Um, I'm not sure why, uh, because he seemed to get a lot of this. Um, but there were, there were gaps. There were others, too. I'd imagine that there's pushback no matter what the government tries to do. Well, there are lobbyists out there. Complaining. Well, there are the sixteen states that are going to go their own way on on climate change, which um, that's a rather interesting thing because. I mean, sixteen states that have instituted tighter regulations. Yes, they're going to follow their their own tighter regulations on um, car emissions, and um, you know, California and New York are two of them. Um, so that, that, that could make a difference. I, I, and I think in the long run, this may bite the Trump administration simply because I think you notice California's economy is not so bad. It's not so shabby. And one of the things that it is good at is uh, competing internationally on cars and on um, um, power. And so I think, I think in the long run, if they continue and they develop things that meet those in environmental standards for the rest of the world, in the long run, they will be ahead. Now, California instituted those policies simply because they had to. I remember Los Angeles way back when, and you could see the air. Uh, the, uh, well, the pollution was just so horrifying. We didn't horrifying. do so bad here in New York either. Oh, it was worse in L.A. Yeah, it was worse there. But, you know, I got just so I didn't trust culture. any air I couldn't <laughs> see. So uh, California has instituted uh, uh, stricter limits on, on the things that we're discussing, uh, and some other states have followed their lead. What would, that, what would it mean if those states had different standards than the country as a whole? The air moves across state lines. Yeah, well, here's the thing. There, there are two, two issues, and one is just plain environmental. If we just dropped all those standards, and we would be adding even more carbon. But we're already adding so much that, you know, maybe that's not a huge difference. But the big thing is economic. If we don't develop the technology to get down to the standards that the rest of the world is going after, we won't be able to compete because they are 
going down. And they are working on these things, and they do have a different set of rules than we do. Would automakers have to make different car models to sell in California? Oh, they already do. They They already do, yes. Yes, there is already a different standard. So can I buy a car, say, and say, I want a California model, (laughs) not an Arizona model? Yeah, and you might want to do that for you. You might want to have a European computer because we're still making some of our computers with lead and cadmium solders and stuff like that, whereas that's been outlawed in the EU for, for decades. You know, I mean, we're, we're slowly losing our ability to compete, um, and, 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 and many of our companies do make two forms of computers, two forms of cars, two forms of things, one for sale, sale there, and that's going to happen more and more. My computer is dangerous? You haven't noticed. (laughs) First of all, it's kicking off all kinds of stuff in your house. It's putting out uh, phthalate plasticizers and brominated fire retardants. We can literally look at the dust in your house and find stuff from your computer and from all of your things. And the the solders that were used to make it um, may well be lead-based. What wouldn't it be in the best interest of a company just to be consistent and make it with the better materials? Well, they seem. Are to they think saving that, that much money? They, they do save money because lead is cheaper, and um, it's it's also if you've ever used the the two solders, you have to be just a little better solderer. Of course, most of that is done. Uh, automatically anyway but if you are actually working with the two solders one is a little more forgiving lead is a very forgiving solder you get a chance to move things a little bit before it sets most soldering these days is done by machines done by robots most of it is done by machine anyway so we really the, the, the difference is small but when you're making thousands of something that small difference is something that sometimes they're willing to go to is the Trump administration trying to revoke California's authority to set its own limits? Oh, that's the next thing. Now, they tried that in the Bush administration. They took California to court twice to try to force them to accept the federal standards and not to have their own, and they lost. But the Trump administration reportedly is really in consultation, looking for a way to try to make it stick this time. And if they get enough people on the courts, maybe they can actually make that happen. Um, you see, when, when, when the Safe Chemicals Act was passed, California's Proposition 65, which is a better labeling law, was grandfathered in. But people are not aware that all of the other states lost their rights to do a similar thing. You have, New York has no right to make tougher chemical laws for consumer products now. Because of federal law? Yeah, because of that s- stupid Safe Chemicals Act, which never should have been passed. When was that passed? Uh, in 2016. 2016, so yeah. it was yeah. during the Obama administration. Yeah, because... and The, and, the president and, had to have signed it. And, and the activists were, were behind it, and they, uh, to me, they just weren't thinking. It's, it's as stupid as banning BPA. Why ban BPA when they just switch to BPS, BPF, BPC? Uh, the, this is bisphenol A. The, the, the operative words are bisphenol. So unless the activists grow up, get some chemical education, and don't keep pushing for these bills and these things that actually make things worse in the long run, uh, I don't know how we're ever going to get through this. Is it an amendment uh, to the Toxic Substances yes. Control Act? Yes, it is. It, 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 was there any improvement to the older act? Not in my book. They they get to test 10 chemicals. Whoopie-doo, you know? And for that, we lose our right to pass tougher laws, and uh, it's just not worth it. It's truly not worth it, that law. And the, this law intersects with California's Proposition 65 labeling law? Right, because Proposition 65 requires labeling of chemicals that the health department in California looks at the research and says these can cause reproductive developmental damage or cancer. If it's any of those three things, they have to label it. And the law enforces itself because what they do is they have a penalty list. You break that law, 
and you, there's a, a set amount of money, you, and it's plenty. It's good, good money. So instead of all you need is the data. You, get, you, you take somebody's product, you analyze it, you find the chemical, it's gold because you now can go to court or the attorney general in California may take the case and you get part of the settlement or you can take them to court and get all of the settlement. So what you have is a, is a law that is enforced by activists and roving bands of lawyers. So you've got a law that enforces itself. The state of California pays nothing because they don't have to have inspectors. They don't have to do the lab data themselves. They just wait for the information to come over the transom. It is beautiful. And it, here's, here's a law that doesn't cost anything of any government agency or taxpayer and it works like a charm. So if the Republicans really do want laws that will actually be enforced and cost nothing, ah, here it is. This is the template. What, what's the position of the Democratic Party, or does it have any position on this? I don't know. I, I would think that they would be behind things like this, but um, I could be wrong because, you know, sometimes people get nervous about putting lawyers in charge of laws. But uh, this law works beautifully. Monona Russell, industrial hygienist and president of Arts, Crafts, and Theater Safety Incorporated, author of uh, a book from Wiley called Pick Your Poison, How a Mad Dash to Chemical Utopia is Making Lab Rats of Us All. This is WBAI 99.5 FM in New York. After 9-11, Monona, uh, we were told that it was safe to breathe the air. <laughs> reminded by that Tom Lehrer song, uh, we were. It was safe to breathe the air in Lower Manhattan, and now aren't people dying from cancers caused by breathing that air? Yes, and let me remind you, <clears throat> Leonard, you and I are listed on an EPA database as being the first people to talk about the issues with the workers and the dust at ground zero. We when, did that on September 17. Mm -hmm. And um, we, I already had a sample because I taught, uh, w there's a group called um, the New York Environmental Law and Justice Project and their head attorney is Joel Kupferman. And I explained to him how to take an asbestos sample, uh, how to document the location, how to keep it, keep it in his possession so that he could sign a chain of custody document. So we already had from the lab, he took that to a lab that I have a, a relationship with, um, data on what that dust contained. So we were already talking very clearly about what was in that dust and why those workers needed protection and that they would get sick if they did not get into respiratory protection, slow down and make sure they're doing this work right. Um, did anyone listen to us? Of course not. Uh, and, and that was again the Republicans. We were back in, the, that was W. And the uh, head of EPA was Whitman. And she told everybody the air was fine. And so I blame her for these deaths. Now, a friend of mine at EPA said, well, she just was given the information by the evil people at, at EPA. But she had access to that data, so I, I, I blame Whitman. Should we assume now, 17 years later, that that air is totally clean again? Well, as clean as air ever gets in a city, because, uh, you know, we have schmutz, and we, you know, there is asbestos fibers on schmutz, every corner. Schmutz, that's a technical term? Sh that's a technical, yeah. We'll you know, give you an analysis of schmutz. But uh, I'm sure that there's still some asbestos and little cracks and uh, nooks and crannies. Yeah, and we were still finding it in uh, in ventilation systems and ducts and, and, and odd places where it had settled yeah, the, 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 and since my field is art, let me just tell you that artists, sometimes you, you really just wonder. An artist got a whole bunch of that dust, took it to Scotland, and had a big show in which they dumped this dust all over the 
gallery so that people could walk around in this dust and see what it was like. I mean, you got to wonder. They were endangering those people's of lives. Of course they were. Of course they were. So this, this is also why you don't want asbestos in things. What about events like the recent steam pipe explosion in the Flatiron District that spewed asbestos all over the area? Same issue. Kaboom. There's about three feet of insulation on those pipes. And when that pipe blows, it blows all of that stuff to kingdom come. The first one that I dealt with was in uh, 89 at Gramercy Park. What an interesting time <laughs> that was because that pipe blew up and over it was a bunch of dirt and rain, so it was mixed with the mud. That mud was real high in asbestos content, and it splashed all over the fronts of the buildings, all over the sidewalks. Some of it broke through people's apartment windows and into the apartment. And Con Ed did nothing for, like, days. And people tracked that mud and the asbestos in it through their buildings into their apartments, and that's why it costs so much. That's why you see this explosion EPA immediately warning people, telling them to get the hell out of their apartments and to bag their clothes. If they had done that in 89, and they, they wouldn't have had the huge expense of completely abating five, <laughs> five big buildings. So, But people live in that area. There are businesses in that area. Are they all unsafe for, for well while? they were at, at for 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 a short while I, absolutely uh, there was well, what no... can you do just vacuum up the whole area yes you really do and you wait for the uh, the breeze to take it away uh, lasagne mama crank and let his mother be sick run let, blow it down the street <laughs> uh -huh. so now it's on 34th street instead of 20th <laughs> yes street. it's it's sad but <laughs> but this is why asbestos doesn't belong in the environment, because but, if it, if you have it in a building, if you have it in a pipe, I don't care where you have it, eventually people are going to be exposed. But it was considered a miracle uh, protector uh, they, when they, it was, they actually many called years. it the miracle material. It was so, actually you could see old old booklets that were talking about what a wonderful fiber it was. Well, it, it did its job. On the other hand, now we know that it's a dangerous thing. But what could Con Ed do? They can't dig up every pipe that they have that was laid in, in 1910. No, but they can at least do what they did here, which is stop everything, let everybody know that this is the problem, at least reduce the, 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 the problem, and provide professional abatement for those buildings and, and so on. Uh, did the Trump administration overrule the, the pleas of scientists to ban the insecticide chlorpyrifos? What is it, chlorpyrifos? <laughs> chlorpyrifos. Chlorpyrifos. It, 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 yeah, they, they, there was a plan to ban it, and, and that was unique. Our EPA looked at all of the studies because it's not quite banned in Europe. It's, it's banned for use in homes and places like that, but it's not banned on agricultural products. Um, but doesn't it leave a residue on the agriculture? Yes, product? it does, and that's what that's what our old EPA under Obama looked at, and they looked at all of the data because it's what it is is it's a it, it's a it damages the synapses in nerve uh, conductivity, so that's how it kills. But in the developing fetus, it can lead to brain damage. Um, and, and neurological difficulty. They really showed pretty good evidence that ADA and some of the other types of things that we're seeing on, in such a rise very much could be related to this particular material. So it's, it, the danger it goes beyond farm workers who yes. are obviously endangered because they are breathing it in as just part of their normal work. Yes, and, and, but if we can keep that low enough, they wouldn't be as much of a problem. But once you... What, but because... Food is eaten by pregnant women. Hmm. There's a really good it's, reason to were take it out farm of workers too. Yeah, there's a really good reason to take it out of the economy and find another pesticide, but that's gone away now. That's not going to happen. Is this such a great pesticide that it's going to be hard to find a substitute? No, you, you know, there's are always all pesticides. A substitute. Yeah, are, well, aren't all pesticides dangerous on some level? I mean, the nature of them is uh, they're they're to kill. Yes. 
uh, there's no nice way to kill stuff. Um, but when you can tie a current problem like the, the brain deficits that we're seeing so common now to a particular chemical, it would make sense to take it out of, of the economy and look for something else. What is REACH? Is it the EU's rules on chemicals? Yeah, it, 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 there's a long, funny name, but you, it, 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 a registration, evaluation, and authorization of chemical substances is sort of a rough translation mm. of, of what it is. And it is, well, it is beautiful what it is. It's just, it's, it's, it, to me, it's just gorgeous to read their regulations and their rules. It's... Awesome. But don't, uh, don't their uh, rules make it impossible for them to import our textiles because uh, there are dyes on them that are now restricted by the dye directive? Oh, the dye directive is for a chemist poetry because what they did is, you know, nobody studied the dyes. There are huge amounts of unstudied dyes. They said, well, we can't afford to just do it all or make industry do it all, but look at the formula. If we can see that that chemical is going to break down to give any of 22 known carcinogens, why study it? It is a carcinogen. And so you can't use those dyes on fabric. We don't have those rules. You've got a lot of carcinogenic dyes, untested, but in chemical classes that we're almost positive are going to cause cancer. So we, we already have big problems in selling to the EU uh, because if we don't sell, we don't follow that rule, we can't sell over there. We they won't take our imports. Th that means that all of my clothing is dangerous on some level. Does washing them get well, rid I of some we'll of these dangerous chemicals? Well, I guess we better just right down quick. <laughs> <laughs> Doing the show in the nude. Uh, can I? Does washing make them safer? Yes, over time? and if, as a matter of fact, the more you wash, and you know how how everything kind of comes off in those first few mm -hmm. washes, you really reduce the amount of, of of dyes. And 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 a lot of people are are going to to dyes that, um, uh, I mean, of colors of things like wool that comes out of the animal color, you know, browns and... Mm -hmm. Natural dyes. Natural, but not natural dyes. See, that's a big well, mistake. in Mexico, they say that all, that the dyes that they put in carpets, for example, are <laughs> not true. They're using Aww, insects, crushed on. insects, and Mother they're using plants. Mother Nature doesn't love you. Many of her dyes are carcinogens. I wish people would grow up. You don't, you don't care whether it's a chemical really is manufactured by God or by Goodyear. You look at the chemical. For instance, six anthraquinones, that's a class, have been studied. All of those anthraquinones cause cancer in animals. There is a dye called alizarin crimson when it is made in the uh, in the laboratory. It's a favorite and color of artists. And it is called artists. rose matter when it comes off of the matter plant root, but it doesn't matter. It is the same chemical, and it will cause cancer whether it's made by God or by Goodyear. So when artists are, are squeezing out a tube of alizarin crimson paint, they're dealing they're with an anthraquinone. They're endangering their, their health? Well, don't, don't, don't eat while you're working, and don't, don't spray it and airbrush it and snort it. Isn't uh, the aren't the the reach uh, rules also? Don't they also apply to jewelry containing nickel because that violates the nickel directive? Yeah, they have something called the nickel directive, and it is a beautiful law, um, essentially banning nickel from any jewelry or even you know your glasses frames or anything that's going to be contacting the skin, um, and if you put a coating over it, that, that coating has got to last with, with heavy use for like two or three years. They have all kinds of, it's a beautiful rule, really well crafted. But I go into, into schools and universities and see the jewelry people making nickel silver jewelry. That's just nuts. You know, we really need to grow up and look at the number of people who are now allergic to nickel from the kinds of jewelry that they're wearing. 
I'm speaking with industrial hygienist Monona Russell. This is Leonard Lopez at Large on WBAI 99.5 FM in New York. What about OSHA, which I know you have had a long history with? Has the Trump administration been trying to eliminate rules that are intended to protect workers? Well, yeah, they they well they've delayed some of the rules, but the most important one is one they simply just didn't um, require the deadline be met. They just, like, dropped it. Uh, And that was the one that Obama worked out where they were going to be submitting electronically their OSHA 300 forms. Any company with more than 250 uh, workers would be submitting those. And that's getting the data on who's injured. What, that's, that's your injury log. But then in May, OSHA decided not to require or accept injury and illness data from employers. That's right. And what reason did they give for that? None. I mean, they just, they don't, it, it's just one of those things that was burdensome, and so they're just walking away from it. And there are, there are people taking them to court to try to, to, try to make that change. The, this week in the U.S. District Court in the District of Columbia, the suit was brought by three safety and health advocacy groups, Public Citizen, the American Public Health Association, and the Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists. What does it ask the court to do? It's asking them exactly what you just asked me. Why? Why, why are you just suddenly walking away from this regulation? This is a regulation. You can't just do nothing. And you see, here's the thing. You can't regulate something or fix something that you can't quantify, that you have no data on. And that's what they want to do. They want to stop the collection of data. They want any kind of rational discussion on how to fix things in uh, uh, workers' situations by not having the data. Doesn't the the possibility of winning or losing depend on the court that uh, that sees the case? And that's what the other this that's, court? that's the other thing he's really good at. Getting yahoos in there on the, on the bench. Do we know about the uh, the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia? No, and you know that's kind of potluck, you know, because you don't know always what judge you're going to get. So, so, but if if you if you know you get enough of them on, and you just keep appealing it and appealing it and appealing it, and then you finally get it up to the Supreme Court, and you got all your boys there, hey, you know. Well, you have the the son of the woman who tried to dismantle the EPA under the Reagan administration, newly appointed to the court. Isn't that nice? What about hazard communication? Is that the labeling of hazardous substances, uh, the labels that say poison or flammable? Is that being also? No, they can't fool with that. And here's why. And here again, it has nothing to do with the goodness of our hearts We had to redo our OSHA hazard communication regulations because the EU REACH put a June 2015 deadline on all imports and said if you don't have the new labeling and the more complicated and and, and informative safety data sheets accompanying that export of yours, we will not take it. So that forces American oh, companies. Yeah. I to mean, use you know, it. I see OSHA trainers t- sitting down with their workers and saying, this is a nice new OSHA regulation. No, you should be telling those workers that we got dragged kicking and screaming into doing this and that we had no choice. Uh, And we were about the last country to adopt it. We thought somehow we were going to get out of it, but, you know, we just couldn't. Getting back to asbestos, because uh, there are, uh, the EPA has proposed new regulations that would uh, add or or eliminate controls for asbestos. Is it true that the plastic wrap around pallets of asbestos bags being shipped to other countries now bear a picture of the president? The one in Russia. Yes, yes, the the mines in Russia, because Russia is one of the big exporters of asbestos. And there's now a, a, a picture of Trump with the approval, uh, you know, approved by the 45th president of the United States, Donald Trump. And on, there's a picture of him on picture the bag? Picture on the bag. And I thought, no, this is just some kind of hoax. 
But I checked it out with Snopes, and I went through it. It, it really is there. That's absolutely so. Now, the president's tariffs are aimed at things like cars. If I buy a European car, a Japanese car, would they have better fuel emission standards than American cars because of the countries that they're made in? You could get it with that, yes. Because, but remember that they do to us what we do to them. They sell us stuff that they can't sell there just as we do the same thing. So you, you would have to make a deal, make sure you're getting something that meets their standards because they'll sell with the lesser standards as well. Uh, they're all in business, so, you know, they'll sell you what, whatever. And then many of those companies are actually making cars in the United States. Mm -hmm. They have factories here. Usually, but they're not bound by the European laws when they're making so them you buy here, a Mercedes so they'll make them Benz to our that's laws. Made in, in North Carolina. Yep, just came back from there. Now, Monona, you're really scaring me. We have just a <laughs> few minutes left. Is there anything positive about all of this? Damned if I know. I I I thought and thought and thought, and um, I I just don't know. I guess if I could wave a wand and do just one thing to make it better, it would be long-term, and I would put science and math back in the schools at all levels and at much more complex than it used to be. Well, like it used to be. You really had to... Because what we have is everything from activists to the people walking around who just can't think scientifically. They just... We've got a population that is very easy to lead in this area because they don't have a framework to put the facts into. But uh, according to the statistics, American business is booming, and some might argue it's because we've eased some of these regulations. Absolutely it's be booming because we got rid of these regulations. <laughs> well, why wouldn't it? You take So that's the trade-off. Yeah, that's the trade-off. You take away the regulations, and then business can be just, you know, laissez-faire capitalism all over again. And, of course, we'll, we'll do just fine. Aren't there some people who are predicting the end of the world in the near future? No, oh, I'm it not isn't here. About I thought it was here already. <laughs> it's here already? <laughs> yeah. No, it's, 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 it's very sad because we really are shortening the time we have here. I've always wondered about uh, people, mostly Asians, who wear masks when they walk through the streets. Are they actually protecting themselves from anything? Uh, those masks actually protect you and not them. Those are medical masks, and they really are, are they're cloth. Uh, those are good for crumbs, flies, and boulders. I mean, they're, they're really, they're, they're going to catch, you know, the mist of your breath a bit, but it's, it's not, you're not protecting yourself from asbestos or anything like that uh, with those cloth masks. Now, you mentioned most of the things we've discussed have been uh, things changed through government agencies. Does Congress, because... We have an election coming up soon. Does Congress have much power in this area? No. I mean, look, look at what's happened. It's just a stale. It's, it's just we, we've lost our way. We, we've, we're playing games with, with, with Congress. It's not, it's not a functioning body. It's truly not a functioning body. That's why Obama did most of his legislation in the White House itself, because there wasn't anything he could get through. And um, this, this president is doing better at getting things through, but they're all things we don't want. Can I still find a copy of your book uh, from Wiley uh, on Amazon? I, I, Amazon, I think, still has it, yeah. It's called Pick Your Poison, How Our Mad Dash to Chemical Utopia is Making Lab Rats of Us All. And that was published before Donald Trump became president. Oh, absolutely. That was uh, 2011. Uh-huh. Yeah. So th and in things fact, were bad back then. then? Back then, there were only 60 million chemicals registered. <laughs> now there's 181 million, which will give you an idea of how fast new chemicals are being invented and registered. And we're going to test, whoopee, 10 of them under the Safe Chemicals Act. Thank you so much for being on our show. Are you depressed sufficiently? <laughs> yes. Okay. Got to go home and... <laughs> Drink a whole bottle of wine by myself. There we go. <laughs> and I hope that wine doesn't destroy my liver. Uh, it, 
That brings us to the end of today's show. My great thanks to today's guest, Monona Russell, to Barbara Kahn, who produced the segment, to Reggie Johnson, who has had the audio controls, to Jesse Lent, who makes things run smoothly, to Charlie Morrow, who provided us with our theme music. You can subscribe to Leonard Lopez at Large Podcast on iTunes and by clicking on Robin Hood Radio's archive program site which is robinhoodradio.com. You can also check out Leonard Lopate at Large Facebook page. We hope to see you next week.